Coming up on One Detroit, changing the system, the ideas behind criminal justice reform in Michigan. Plus, Nolan talks with newly appointed ambassador and former Walbridge head John Ricolta Jr. as he leaves for his new post in the United Arab Emirates. Also coming up, help for small business owners along the Avenue of Fashion in Detroit and an unforgettable look inside the sewer system. Grossly fascinating, we promise. I'm Christy McDonald at Recipes in Troy. So pull up a chair. One Detroit is coming your way. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund. And by... Business Leaders for Michigan has five priorities to make Michigan a top 10 state. Achieve a balanced budget. Cut long-term debt. Fix our roads. Improve all levels of education. Further economic growth. Plan for a stronger Michigan. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. We are at one of my favorite places in Troy this week, Recipes. My coffee cup will never be empty. And we have a big show coming up for you. I we catch we up with Supreme Court Chief Justice Bridget McCormick and Maybe Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist for a closer look at ideas to change the jail system in the state. Also coming up, Nolan Finley sits down with newly appointed Ambassador John Ricolta. Plus, the city of Detroit gets serious about helping small businesses struggling along the avenue of fashion during that big construction project. Project. Stephen Henderson has that conversation for us. And then the closest look inside the sewer system you'll ever want to see and why they're studying the historic fatberg they found in Macomb County. It's a gross one, but it's a good one. That's all coming up on One Detroit. But we're starting with a hard look at the number of people in jail across the state, the amount of time they're behind bars, and how much it costs all of us. According to Pew Charitable Trust, there has been a significant decline in the overall crime rate in Michigan, but the number of people in jail has tripled since 1970. In 2017 alone, taxpayers spent $478 million on county jail and corrections costs. Well, now the state is looking into real criminal justice reforms that not only helps the people in the system, but keeps communities safe. I think we can really become a leader in making sure we have a criminal justice system that treats people fairly, um, protects victims, and also makes communities safer, um, even if that's going to mean some bold changes. A lot of people who are, have been incarcerated, they really could be better served by some other set of services, whether that's services for substance abuse, services for mental health uh, challenges, and we need to be thinking about those kind of alternatives and investing in them. Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, along with Supreme Court Chief Justice Bridget McCormick, are among 21 members of Michigan's newly created jail task force. Set up by Governor Gretchen Whitmer last spring, the task force is traveling around the state with public hearings, like this one last week at Wayne State University to see what changes can be made to expand alternatives to jail and take a hard look at the numbers. According to data from the Pew Charitable Trust, nearly two-thirds of jail admissions are for misdemeanor charges, and the demographics of who is behind bars is changing. Also seeing that a lot of uh, women are being locked up in those rural jails for really nonviolent offenses, for, for drug possession or substance abuse disorder, or also for shoplifting. And so these nonviolent offenses, things that could probably be treated by citation rather than arrests, things that can be treated by other sorts of pretrial services and deflecting them to, again, some other sort of service that could be help, more helpful and more rehabilitative than them sitting in jail. What we're seeing statewide is jail populations have actually grown more significantly in rural parts of the 
um, state and, and have, have, have actually slightly declined in some of the urban centers, Detroit included. Um, having said that, we hear some of the same complaints about who ends up in Detroit, in the, in the Wayne County Jail and why. Um, and so some of the same issues we're seeing across the state, what the role mental health is playing in people serving time in jail, pretrial and post-trial, the role of substance abuse, and how we are thinking about um, the underlying problems that are driving to people, to, to people in jail are certainly issues um, in Detroit, um, but they are as well in other parts of the state. The task force expects to give their recommendations to the legislature in January. If you want to weigh in on things that should be changed, just head to our website at DetroitPBS.org and we'll have the link there for you. All right, turning now to newly appointed Ambassador John Ricolta Jr. You know John is the head of Walbridge in Detroit. He's been on our show before talking about reform at Detroit Public Schools and he's a very prominent Republican fundraiser. Well, he was just confirmed in September as Ambassador to the United Arab Emirates. John leaves for his post at the end of the month, so Nolan Finley sat down with him to talk about how he got the nod and how the UAE figures into the global conversation today. Ambassador to the UAE, normally it's a career diplomat position. You're an, uh, a political appointee. How did you end up going to the UAE? Oh, well, that's a really good question, and uh, what I'm about to say is speculation because mm -hmm. they don't actually tell you mm -hmm. what all the calculus is. But, but you I, put your name in for an ambassador. I, I, I put my name in mm -hmm. in this administration to do a number of things. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out that they felt that uh, I'd be best serving our country as being an ambassador, and they pointed me toward Romania. Mm -hmm. And so they so first asked me, from, that's right? where my family comes from, they first asked me, if I would be interested in the ambassadorship to Romania, and of course I said yes. Uh, I went through about six or seven months of the process, and I got a phone call from the White House in the late fall of 2017, just mm -hmm. as I was about to probably get deployed, asking to come to Washington, at which time they said they had a change of heart and they would like to know if I'd be interested in serving in a moderate Arab country. I, uh, I asked which one. They said, well, we'd like to get you uh, to give us an answer first before we tell you exactly which <laughs> one. And so I said, I would uh, because uh, of my connection to the Middle Eastern community here in Southeast Michigan, mm -hmm. my involvement in New Detroit, uh, my involvement in uh, helping the Detroit public school system resurrect mm -hmm. itself. So all of those things came together and I agreed at which time they told me it was the United Arab Emirates. Well, this is no tea in the afternoon assignment. This is a, a very difficult part of the world. The president recently announced he was dispatching troops to United Arab Emirates as well as Saudi Arabia. You've got uh, this now emerging conflict between Turkey and Syria. It's a very high tension part of the world. Do you feel fully prepared and ready to take this on? I think the word fully prepared mm -hmm. is probably a little bit further than, 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 than I would say I am at this point in time, but I do feel I'm prepared. I bring a separate yeah. and distinct set of skills, experiences. Mm -hmm. There is a large staff of people in the embassy approaching a thousand. Uh, they have experts in every single field. And so at the end of the day, uh, an ambassador is representing the President of the United States, has legal authority as if they almost were like the President of the United States. And uh, the ambassador requires a lot of thought uh, uh, in, uh, on any problem uh, and ultimately has to have great discernment and final judgment on what ends up happening there. Now, I'm not the only voice. There are many, many voices mm -hmm. that are shaping policy. Uh, Talk to us about the relationship between the UAE and the United States and the strategic importance of the country. Well, first of all, it's a great relationship mm -hmm. and uh, we view the United Arab Emirates as one of our staunchest allies. Mm -hmm. They have supported us in virtually all of our policies in the Middle East, from Syria to Afghanistan to Iraq, have fought by us side by side. So they're a great, great ally. In terms of competition, mm -hmm. competition's good. And uh, we need to continue to show the UAE and they us how strong our relationship is and the fact that they are having uh, 
talks and discussions with other countries only serves to broaden the opportunity to deploy diplomacy uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, conflict and violence. And so we, uh, we see the United Arab Emirates as uh, continuing to be a great uh, partner of ours. Do you have a first assignment when you get there? Uh, I have three assignments, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked the question. Mm -hmm. uh, really, you look at an ambassadorship as three Ps. Mm -hmm. The first is uh, protection, protect, uh, protect the citizens of the United States in the UAE and protect the national interests of our country. Mm -hmm. The second is uh, promote, uh, promote the well-being of our two country relationships through economic ties, educational mm -hmm. ties, uh, cultural ties, music, film, yeah. uh, there's many, many ways to promote those ties. And then the final is to advocate for peace. Mm. And uh, that's probably just as important as the first one in the sense that, uh, you know, diplomacy is about using influence to change people's minds as opposed to violence. And uh, we need to do more of that. And so those are my objectives when I go there. But the first objective is to sit down with the embassy staff, have a town hall meeting, and talk about my style of uh, doing business, uh, mm -hmm. my style of, uh, of management, and to talk about the values that I see being so important to us to continue that the embassy will work as a unified and cohesive team. And you can see Nolan's full interview at DetroitPBS.org. There's progress to report on that 1.2 mile streetscape construction project on Detroit's Avenue of Fashion. We did our show from there a few weeks ago. Some of the sidewalks have been replaced and parking options have improved. But the businesses along Livernois are still struggling to keep their doors open and get their customers back during this major disruption. The city has stepped in to help with a marketing campaign and loan and grant programs. Well, Stephen Henderson spoke with Arthur Jemison, Group Executive for Detroit Planning, Housing and Development, and two Livernois Avenue business owners about the planning and the impact of the project on American Black Journal. Starting about two years ago, a planning process began in that neighborhood uh, to address a series of things, streetscape, single family housing, um, you know, the corner of Seven Mile and, um, and, and Livernois has a major uh, commercial corridor building uh, happening on it, um, with the idea of changing the streetscape, making it more retail friendly. Um, and in those conversations, there was a decision about the length of it, and there was a decision about uh, what it should look like. Um, there were a series of community meetings that led up to the decision to go forward in this way. Um, and I think, frankly, um, what, there was a gap between uh, the end of the conversation about uh, what it would look like um, and the engagement of business owners about um, what they were going to experience yeah. uh, during the construction. And so uh, as we began to meet with them after that, that's when some of the things we'll talk about now are going to took shape. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the, the whole thing was underestimated in terms of what impact it would have. I actually live in the area, and mm -hmm. I underestimated how disruptive uh, it would be. Um, talk about what, I mean, I know you've gotten a lot of complaints from mm -hmm. business owners and, and people in the neighborhood. Uh, talk about what you're trying to do now to make sure that, uh, that they're taken care of. Sure. So there was that moment where the decision was made to try to get the product to not take a year to, or to over two years and have it happen in one construction season. But that really put a lot of vehicles and a lot of equipment on that street working quickly, also on Saturdays. Uh, so what we did was we, we sat, I mean, the conversation's got to start with listening, right? Yeah. So uh, we met at one of the businesses, Good Cakes and Bakes, on the street. Um, and uh, frankly, I got to hear in detail everybody's concerns, what their losses were. And then we began to think about what we could do to support them. And then, so we, we began to host these events called Livernois Soups. Uh, they're based on the Detroit Soup model that mm -hmm. uh, the Build Institute has, where there's a, a pitch competition effectively. Um, but we made every person who competed a winner in some way, and the host got uh, grant funds. This is a way to get people out on the street as well as providing grant money. Uh, and so the second piece was a loan and grant combination. Mm -hmm. So um, businesses are eligible for up to $20,000, of, of which only $8,000 has to be repaid. The other 12000 is a grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we closed three of those loans, um, one to one to Hugh just a couple of days ago. Uh, we got another 22 applications we're expecting to process shortly. Um, but again, these are things that came out of a conversation saying we need cash and your support today. Um, how can you help us today? So what was your understanding of what was gonna happen before this happened? What was your understanding of how disruptive this well, was? Well, I have to be candid. I, I didn't get much information. Yeah. Um, 
um, at all. Um, I, I walked into my business um, and saw a bulldozer in front of my door so mm -hmm. as I'm opening up. And I had to ask the uh, construction person, um, what are you doing? And he says, well, we're going to rip your streets up here. And I said, wait a minute. Um, when did this project yeah. begin? And so then I, uh, at that point, I was engaged in the process very deeply. Yeah. Uh, then I went to seek out to see exactly what was going on and figure out what had happened. Um, votes were taken, votes were made. And so, again, those things are water under the bridge for me. W what I have at Baker's is an institution. Yeah. And so in that institution, I'm trying to be the um, steward and um, uh, make sure that, that it stays um, uh, relatively close to what yeah. it has been for 85 years. Yeah. And so my job is to figure out now with this, in, is this situation happening, how can I now maintain and keep my doors open? Yeah. It's, it's certainly been a huge impact. Uh, we're, we're happy that the city uh, has taken the approach uh, to make things better uh, with the suit program along with the uh, grant program slash loan. Uh, so uh, we're happy with the progress, uh, but again, there's still a lot more that has to be done mm -hmm. uh, because it's such a, a huge impact that we've uh, all experienced. Uh, for me, as an example, uh, we're not just your average restaurant where we can cut costs and cut corners. Because we're a white tablecloth, fine dining restaurant, we have to be polished and at the best of our game every single day. Yeah. Uh, so we can't go with a different style tablecloth. We can't cut our, <laughs> our waiters and waitresses. We, we can't cut our chefs uh, in the back of the house. Everything has to still be stellar from A to Z. Uh, and y your inventory, your food products, et cetera, uh, we've lost probably 65, 70% of our, our sales uh, mm. since the construction. Okay, you might wanna put down whatever you're eating for this next segment. Have you ever heard of a fatberg? No, I didn't just insult someone. It's the goop and the blockage that collects in a sewer. All right, I think I just choked just a little bit there. Well, one of the biggest fatbergs occurred in Macomb County, and now it's being studied to better understand what we can do to cut down on this kind of waste. This is the story that you're gonna be talking about this week. Will Glover has our Great Lakes Now special report. Our tale begins in Macomb County, Michigan at the Clintondale pump station. Before we go inside, I have to warn you, this story is disgusting and I don't like disgusting. So of course, my wonderful coworkers decided I'd be perfect to cover a story about things that we find in the sewer. This is a sewage pump station. And in 2018, they found something big in a sewer not far from here. Well, Candace Governor, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm here to meet Macomb County Public Works Commissioner Candace Miller. If there's sewer problems, they're her problems. Let's just cut to the chase. What is a fatberg? Well, a fatberg uh, is something that sometimes sewer systems, uh, they're found in the sewer systems. Macomb County found one made up of greases and oils that people have put down their drain rather than disposing of them properly in their garbage. And our particular fatberg was 19 tons, 100 feet long. 100 feet long? 11 feet wide and six foot tall. That was our fatberg. That's a gigantic clog. And if it gets too big, it can mean raw sewage backs up into basements or gets released into rivers or lakes. The fatberg removal cost $100,000. Its discovery came as Miller's team was looking more closely at what was going on beneath. A few years before Miller became commissioner, an aging sewer pipe collapsed, causing a sinkhole. Part of a major street and a house fell in, repairs costing many tens of millions of dollars. A big story, but the fatberg, that was even bigger. Okay, good morning, everyone. With a piece of the Fatberg by her side, Commissioner Miller invited the press to come by and see it. The Fatberg had its star turn in the fall of 2018. But as I say, we want to use this as a teachable moment, if we can, for folks to try to change people's behavior of what they're putting down the sewers. What behavior does she want you to change? Well, this is a flushable wipe, and Candace Miller wants you to stop flushing things like this down the drain. Because once this gets in the sewer system, it can form what's called a rag ball. And once oil and grease and dirt and trash get caught up in this, it can start to form a gigantic fatberg. The wipes were the binding agent for the Macomb County fatberg. How do you get this stuff out of the sewer or out of the water system? Well, what you can see here is what we call the rake. And so this thing literally goes down very deep into our wet well here, and it is pulling up these, these wipes, these rags as we call them. 
and they dump them right into a bin, right? A trash bin oh, here. No. A big dumpster. Oh my goodness. That and is so terrible. we get uh, several of these dumpsters a week mm -hmm. at this particular facility just full of these uh, wipes. It looks foul, but the smell is diabolical. Most of the fatberg is now in a landfill, but some of it is being studied at Wayne State University's Integrative Biosciences Center, where Tracy Baker looks after it. Do you have an actual piece of the fatberg here in this lab, correct? That's correct, yes. And so were you really excited when you found out you were going to be working and studying a fatberg? Were you like, yay? <laughs> I was a little maybe timid at first. Yeah. Carol Miller had um, contacted me asking if I would be interested in studying the fatberg. Uh, I had to kind of look up what a fatberg was, was before say, I made that know? decision. <laughs> Carol Miller, no relation to Candace Miller, was the driving force behind getting the fatberg into the laboratory. I'm uh, very interested in what goes through our pipes, so when this huge backup occurred in Macomb County, I thought, wow, this is exactly my sort of stuff. Baker and Miller and a team of students are getting to know the fatberg up close and personal. So your hands are in the tank, you're right. moving stuff around. So we're just looking to see what we can find in the fatberg. It's mostly plastic and wipes. We found a bunch of tampon applicators and we can see like sheets like this which is just um, wipes, looks like. Is there anything in these fatbergs that you guys have pulled out that you're like surprised by? Like, surprised. I never thought that would be in a sewer, much less here with me now. Mustard packets. Yeah. <laughs> Mustard Individual. packets? Yeah, it just looks like somebody's trash can. What are we trying to find out? We're trying to find out what sort of compounds are included in a fatberg. We want to know a little more about what sort of chemicals are involved in a fatberg and how could those impact us if bypasses occur and the sewage, the raw sewage goes into the river and then we drink that water. So what we put into the water eventually comes back into our body. But so we'd made... like to know about what's in those pipes. Yeah, you just made your job exponentially more important there when you, you put go. it that way. We think that it's probably acting as a sponge because the wipes kind of absorb. So I think that right. it could definitely be concentrating chemicals and then the bacteria, because it's sitting in sewage for a long amount of time, like the bacteria, many different kinds of bacteria, potentially harmful ones, could be accumulating. So when you're looking at bacteria, is that like a DNA test? Like you're testing the DNA to see which bacteria, to identify the bacteria? Exactly, yeah. So we take parts of the fatberg and then we're able to do an extraction. We concentrate it and then do an extraction and then we do DNA sequencing to look at all the different bacteria so that are part of it. It's 23andMe but for a fatberg. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. The research also comes back to the biggest issue concerning this fatberg mess. It's these wipes. When they go down the drain, how do they break down? This is a wipe that was, that said that it was flushable after 48 hours. I don't think that's going to go through. I don't think so either. I'm not the smartest man in the world, but... <laughs> so you can see that is almost fully intact. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. And um, this is flushable. This is a flushable wipe, yep. As you can see, didn't break down. And that's basically what we see for almost all of the wipes that we've been looking at. And giving the wipes more time doesn't seem to help. This particular wipe has been in this water for over a year. A year? And it looks like you just put it in there a it minute ago. It looks brand new. It looks brand new. There are defenders of flushable wipes, which are a worldwide multi-billion dollar a year industry. The Responsible Flushing Alliance, yes, it's a real thing, it's an industry group, says that it's not flushable wipes that's the problem. It's people flushing things like paper towels, feminine hygiene products, and other non-flushable items down the toilet. But the folks specializing in sewage say you shouldn't flush anything but toilet paper. No wipes of any kind, no matter what they say. You know, if you pick one of those up in the grocery store and it says flushable, and you're using it, you're thinking, oh, flushable, I'm flushing it, right? I'm gonna flush it down the toilet. Right. Must be all right, says so right there, you know, on the packaging. Actually, it's a nationwide pro, uh, problem, and even internationally. In fact, London just had to deal with a big fatberg. New York has a big fatberg. They're around, and they're, it's because of all these wipes. There's no safe sewer system anywhere. No, and we're doing it to ourselves. I think the Congress should be passing some legislation that outlaws uh, them from packaging with those words on there, that they're flushable. They should say non-flushable, non-biodegradable. And other than that, if they just did that, that would be fine. 
Okay, that was something. And you can watch our Great Lakes Now report every month. Just check out DetroitPBS.org for more. And that is going to do it for us this week. I'd like to thank everyone at Recipes in Troy for having us today. You know I'll see you for Sunday brunch next week. And I'll see you next Thursday for another One Detroit. Take care. Help us expand One Detroit's local journalism coverage. Go to dptv.org slash One Detroit and click on the mug to donate. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV the Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and by Business Leaders for Michigan has five priorities to make Michigan a top 10 state. Achieve a balanced budget, cut long-term debt, fix our roads, improve all levels of education, further economic growth, plan for a stronger Michigan. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Also brought to you by Ally, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.